Father, we thank you for amazing grace. God, it is by grace that we are saved through faith and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are your workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Father, we thank you for that amazing grace, God, a grace that covers all of our sin, a grace that where sin ab abounds, grace does super abound, hyper abound. And Father, for those who have a trouble with uh, or a problem with hyper grace, Father, we rejoice in it because our sins are so innumerable, God, we can't even count them. They're more than the hairs of our head, as we read in the, in the psalm this morning earlier. God, we thank you for grace. And now, God, as we look at this, at this precious word in Romans chapter 8, Father, this, this salvation, God, that cannot be taken away from us, we cannot be denied that gracious gift of eternal life in Christ, Lord. May you seal it to our heart, Father. Fortify our spirit and strengthen us for the work and the week that's ahead of us, God. Because we are weak, and Lord, we're easily distracted. So nourish our hearts with your word and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, Romans chapter 8, verse 35 through 37. We're going through again. As I pointed out, there are no commandments in Romans chapter 8. And you know, the more I was thinking about it, I don't even know if up to this point if we've had a command in all of Romans. I'll have to go back and look at that. And I re recognize that if you look at Ephesians, uh, Ephesians, the first three chapters are, are, are all exhortations of truth that God has done for us in Christ. They're foundational truths that we receive and believe and stand in. And then the final three chapters are the word that keeps repeating itself is walk, 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 which is to live the Christian life. So that's always the order. We find ourselves who we are positionally in Christ, and then from that position of Christ, that security, we go forward and we walk. The pattern of grace that we've talked about these several weeks that we've gone through Romans chapter 8, several months now, the pattern of grace is that, number one, God initiates grace with a promise. And that promise is made to us through a word, and that word is contained in this book. It's not by our dreams, visions, of uh, uh, I don't know, other means, uh, you know, audible voices. It is by the Word of God that God has promised to us pre great and precious promises. And the fundamental truth is that God will do the impossible. God makes a promise to do the impossible. We read uh, this morning in Hebrews chapter 11 how, um, how Moses, by faith, led the Israelites through the Red Sea. And, the, and it parted, and, the, and not only did it part, but we learned that the ground was dry. It wasn't even less this muck mire that they're slogging through. It was a perfectly dry place, and they walked through by faith. So God does the impossible. He's demonstrated that. And God has done the impossible of saving sinners through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. In fact, we see that that was God bearing his right arm of power. I just flexed my left arm, but he, he, he did the right arm of power. Uh, when he saved us, that was nothing to part the Red Sea, but to redeem fallen man, sinful man, he had to become a man himself and bear the penalty of our sin upon himself, to be crucified, to shed his blood upon the cross, to be buried and raised again, that we might have eternal life. You see, God cannot wink at sin, he can't overlook it, he must judge it in his holiness. But God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth upon Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Folks, it's, it's that simple. And so God initiated that to us today in the year 2019 or in the moment we believed, which for me was at the age of 16, through a promise. And that comes by the Word of God. Then we respond by faith. God promised, I will, God will do the impossible. Then we receive that word by faith and we say, I am persuaded that God will do the impossible. At that moment, the age of 16, I was persuaded that Jesus Christ did in fact die on the cross for my sins. That he was buried and that he did in reality, <coughs> historically, raised from the dead. I believed upon Jesus Christ at my dinner table and God did the impossible. He saved me from my sins at the age of 16. My name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. I have an eternal future of glory. My, when, when the roll is called up yonder, I will be there. That's not just a feel-good song for me. It's a song of affirmation of truth that I will be there. And if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, 
You'll be there too. And finally, when we believe, then God acts in a miracle. And miracle power is the response. The Holy Spirit does the impossible that God said He would do. And for us, the salvation is granted to us. We're born again. We're sons and daughters of God by faith. He changes us. He gives us the very righteousness of Jesus Christ. And we have eternal life through Him. So that is a pattern of grace. Promise, faith, and then the miracle comes. Now we've looked at, uh, from verses 31 to 34, I just want to rehearse the love of God as it was demonstrated before we actually look at verse 35 through 37. We see in verse 31 that God is for us. God is for us. And we're going to read, we need to know this because as we read through here and as we look at our lives, we look at circumstances and we say, I don't know if God was for me this week. I had a good week, you know, a couple of weeks ago. This week was a little bit rougher. I'm not sure if God is for us. Uh, so I need to be reaffirmed that truth, that God has not forsaken me. Um, so number one, God is for us. And oh, by the way, if God is for us, then guess what? None can be against us. We learned that. There's no one that can be against us. Oh, there's a lot of people against us, but they cannot succeed. And we're to find, even if they bring to us death, if they are able to kill the body, they still have failed. I, I don't want to give too much away, but the, the verse we're going to close on today is that in all these things we are more than conquerors. We're hyper-conquerors. We're more than victorious, even in those moments of, of suffering and death. God did not spare His own Son, but instead He delivered up His own Son for us all. And we know from Romans 5.8 that this is the expression and the demonstration of the love of God. Again, we do not look to our circumstances to find intrinsically that silver lining. Now we know that all things work together for good, but individually if we look at our circumstances, it's very difficult sometimes to see good. We have to take it by faith. We've got to receive it by faith. Otherwise, Look, if you haven't figured out that in this world you shall have tribulation, just live another week and you'll figure that out if you haven't already. Right? <laughs> we, can, we can laugh now. <laughs> uh, verse 33, we learn, none can lay, who can lay a charge against God's elect? It is God that justifies. None. No one can lay a charge against God's elect. Why? Is that because we've stopped sinning? We're such good Christians? No, not at all. Just as we read, I love that passage. It, that David said that my iniquities are more than I can count. They're more than the hairs of my head. You see, that's true of us. We have sin, but the beauty is that no one can lay a charge against us because the righteousness of Christ has been granted to us. We're, we don't stand in our own righteousness. And remember that God blesses man to whom God will not impute iniquity. He just simply won't impute it to our account. Though our sins are mounted up as, as high as the heavens, His grace is super abundant. He will not hold us guilty and hold us accountable, not because we're good, but because we are in Christ Jesus. And He is our righteousness. And He's perfect. It is God that justifies. We must always remember this. Because Satan will take... He, Satan loses in, the, in, in God's courtroom. Okay, he loses all the time. But he finds great success when he comes into our heart and brings accusation. That's where he finds his greatest success. And the great shield of defense that we have against his accusation is that God has justified us. God has declared us righteous. Not my pope or my priest or my bishop or my guru... But my God, the creator of all things, has said, you are righteous. He has declared me and you righteous if you have believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. That's good news. That's, that's counterintuitive. But that's grace. God has justified us. Now, if God has justified us, who can condemn? Who can overrule the decree of Almighty God for His children? No one can. That's right. Even our own heart. Even our own heart, which condemns us frequently, cannot overrule the justification of God. And we need
need to stand in that and say, when our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. That's what the Bible says in 1 John. God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Satan can attack us. We take our helmet off and we're like, I don't need this anymore. I'll take this breastplate of righteousness off. I don't need a helmet of salvation. I'm sick of it all. And then the arrows hit y'all in the head and you're like, whoa, am I even saved? I'm confused, man. What's going on here? Well, guess what? God's not confused. Your name's still written in His book. Your, his righteousness is still imputed to you. Even though you foolishly disarmed yourself and are walking around naked in the battlefield. And we wonder why we struggle. I just don't know why I'm having such a hard time. I just don't know if I'm saved. I'm really confused about all this. Let's put your helmet of salvation on. First of all, let's begin right there. Okay, that'll help to clear up the mind. You're saved, not because you're good. Really? Yeah, isn't that good news? Amen. We're saved because God's good. Amen. Gracious. Who condemns us? It is Christ that died. Christ arose. He's seated at the right hand. He's inter interceding for us. Are you serious? You've got condemnation for me? You better talk to Jesus Christ about that. We look at these things and we see the concrete and substantive demonstration of God's love. Remember, our temptation, as we get into this text, our temptation is to look at our circumstances and determine if God loves us. To look at our bank account, to look at our, our wrist, <laughs> to, to look at our, our, our medical chart, or whatever it is our circumstances have in front of us right now. But the concrete and substantive demonstration of the love of God is in Christ Jesus suffering, dying, raising from the dead for us. Now, we get into our text today. It says, now, now we've demonstrated this love. Now it says, now, now who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Okay, let's, let's just, let's, isn't it great? God, uh, God's not afraid and the Apostle Paul's not afraid to ask the tough questions. You know, it might be afraid, like, I don't really want to know who can separate, you know. No, it's really good news. There's nobody. This, that's the implied answer. Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Um, the word separate means, guess what? To separate. It means to place room between, to part or to divide. Who can do that? Who can reach into heaven and say, by the power that they have to separate us? Because it's very clear that we're in the love of God. Now, now the question is, can anyone separate us from that love at any point or time in, in the future? That's a, a valid question we need to know. And it's interesting, as I was, I've got some handouts today. Um, if you noticed on the back today, you don't have, we're going to be going through this chart on the back. Um, we don't have a, a, the outline, but we're going to spend most of the time of the message in this chart. But what's interesting, I was at Cracker Barrel yesterday, and I saw some little cute little sign there, and it had this sign on it. It's a mathematical sign. You ever, anybody know what that sign is? Stop Division. Division. Yeah. It's a division sign. I can't <laughs> <laughs> you can watch the video. Yeah, you <laughs> Go to YouTube. Okay, it's a division sign. You know, it never, ever, ever dawned on me until I was in Cracker Barrel just two days ago. No, it was yesterday. <laughs> oh, it's a division sign. See how that line divides two dots? Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. Duh. <laughs> Makes sense, right? Yes. <laughs> So I thought, isn't that something, isn't that an interesting illustration, a division sign? So before we came to Christ, we were separated from Christ. We were separated from God. Here's me down here. I was separated from Christ, who is eternal life. He's the eternal life. But sin had made a separation between me and my God. He will not hear my prayer, Isaiah 59, 2, because my iniquities have separated from me and my God. And so here I am separated by sin from Christ, who is eternal life. So when you're separated from eternal life, guess what? That's called death. That barrier of sin could not be breached. There was nothing I could do to overcome the penalty of my sin. But then we look at the cross, you see. The cross has reconciled and united me with Christ. See, Christ bore the penalty of my sin. He did all the work. He took away that barrier, that sin barrier. He removed it when He died on the cross. And now I am one with Christ. Me and Christ and Christ in me, that equals eternal life. 
Again, eternal life isn't something God says, okay, I'm gonna, I've am gonna. i got a little eyedropper. I'm going to drop three drops of eternal life into Ron. Through one, two, three. Now, don't lose that. Don't slosh that out because that's all you get is three drops of eternal life. No, He's fused me with Jesus Christ. He's fused me with His Son. His Son is raised. I'm raised. His Son is exalted to the heavenlies. Guess what? The Bible says we're seated with Christ in the heavenlies. So Jesus Christ took care of that division. So now the question is, okay, sin has already been dealt with. So now, who? okay, what else have we got left that can separate us from the love of God? What else can cause this division to reoccur again? Well, let's look at some things here that he goes through. Let's see if there's anything left that can separate us. Shall tribulation, tribulation. The word for tribulation is the word thlipsis, and it means... Uh, antagonistic pressure basically it means pressure pressure you ever been under pressure <laughs> anyone <laughs> besides me and Heather <laughs> okay I would wager by the wrinkles on the faces out there a lot of people have been under pressure if you don't have wrinkles yet you will <laughs> some get more sooner than others but um, it's it's in our future um, Philipsis is is pressure pressure you think about pressure. Um, if I'm not under pressure, I just freely do what I want, right? I just kind of, I kind of do what I want, and no, there's no obstacle, there's no pushback, no blowback. I get to do whatever I want. I get to express myself freely, and then pressure comes in. It says, ah, uh -uh, not anymore. There's pushback and and persecution. Now, in this context, of course, it is it is an antagonistic pressure that comes against the children of God. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, though, let's look at tribulation, and this is uh, truth number 68. Tribulation cannot separate us from the love of Christ. Tribulation cannot separate, it cannot divide us from the love of Christ. Why not? 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. Again, talking back uh, to that union that we have with Christ, we have been immersed. That's what baptizo means. It, baptized, immersed into the body of Jesus Christ. We've not been sprinkled into the body of Christ. We are immersed into the body of Christ. We are one with Christ inseparably. And tribulation, no matter what kind of tribulation we experience, cannot divide us again. It doesn't have the power to pry us out. In fact, it's not as though like we're two pieces fused together we are one with Christ. And, and the illustration, uh, when, I, when I go through the baptism class, the word baptizo is, it, there was a, they found this, uh, like an old recipe book with this word in it, in the Greek. And it was, to, they would put a cucumber in this uh, boiling water, and the, and the boiling water transformed the very cucumber. You know, it, it changed the, the cucumber. The, the savoring in the, in, the, in the boiling water entered into it and became, you know, like transformed by this boiling water. And so we're immersed into Christ and now we have His righteousness. So tribulation, the pressures that we experience cannot separate us. We're sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption uh, uh, in Christ. We're sealed. So tribulation, philipsis, or antagon antagonistic pressure cannot separate us from the love of Christ. Now get this. Now, I didn't make that up. That's not my quote. This is the text. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation? The implied answer is no. Okay? We all agree with that? or does anyone disagree with that? No one disagrees with that. Okay. All right. So let's look then at Matthew chapter 13, verse 21. Oh, my. This shed wonderful light on the Word of God. You ever heard of the seed and the soil and the sower and the seed and the soil there in Matthew 13? Well, there's the, the rocky soil, and we see in the text here, uh, Matthew uh, chapter 13, verse 21, says, uh, it's speaking of this, of this picture of this hard soil, says, Yet he hath no root in himself. So the seed fell in the soil, it, it, it sprouted up, it sprung up, but it didn't grow down deep. It just was, had superficial roots on the surface because there were stones in the, in the ground and it couldn't bear its roots deep. But notice what it says. 
He says, He has no root in Himself. He endures for a while. For when tribulation, same word, thalipsis, or persecution arises because of the Word, by and by He is offended. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. That person was clearly not saved. He's from rocky soil. He didn't endure. He stumbled when persecution came. Yeah, welcome to humanity. Read the history of the church. You think the history of the church is filled with conquerors who all burned at the stake and, and everyone was faithful unto death? No. But do you know what? We're not saved because we're faithful unto death. We're saved because Christ was faithful unto death. Amen. And folks, when we will rest in that, we might just be faithful unto death. If we'll do that. We just might be. But I want you to look at that. The, the scripture says, will tribulation separate us from the love of Christ? No! Then why are there teachers who say this person is lost because tribulation pulled them away and they are, were offended and stumbled? Because we don't read our Bible as well. Anyway, I won't get on that commentary. Okay. Tribulation. Okay, so tribulation won't. How about distress? You ever been under distress? I think of SOS. You've got a ship going down, you've got massive waves, and you pull out that flare. <laughs> you fire that flare because the pressure has pushed me, the, the bow is under the water, and I've got like 10 feet of the stern left, and I'm clinging on to this. In other words, I'm, the, the noose is tightening on me. I'm going to perish if something isn't done quickly. And you fire off that flare in hopes that somebody will see it and come rescue you. So that I picture this narrowness of room. That's what it means, narrowness of room. How many people have seen Star Wars, the original? Okay, so remember when they're they're in the trash bin, you know, it's crushing in. That's duress. And if the, if you don't, if R two D two don't get the code right, we're gonna die. We're gonna die in here because I can't get out. I'm trapped. Okay, so that's duress, narrowness of room, SOS, a sinking ship. No, nope, duress cannot separate us from the love of Christ. It cannot separate us. Okay, what about persecution? Tr truth number 70. What about persecution? Persecution means to pursue with harassing or oppressive treatment. So in, in other words, it's not they're not content just to, to harass you when you're in their presence. But when you flee from the persecution, they follow you. They're pursuing you. They're relentlessly pursuing you till they destroy you. What about that? Can that separate us from the love of God? The implied answer is no. Persecution cannot separate us from the love of Christ. Now again, as you're going through persecution, as you're going through distress, as you're going through tribulation, if you look at those things, you're going to say, God doesn't love me. Satan will attack you and lie to your heart and say, God has forsaken you or else why would you be suffering these things? We've already read that all things work together for good to them that love God. That scripture wouldn't have to be in the text if everything was always rosy, you know, and everything was always great. We wouldn't need a verse like that. We would say, duh, I won the lottery and I got, I'm, I'm healthy as a horse and everybody in my family is healthy. And we wouldn't need a verse like that. So we have to look beyond our senses. So persecution cannot separate us from the love of Christ. Famine. What about famine? This famine is a scarcity of food, hunger pangs. Quite honestly, we're Americans. We, we read about hunger pangs in books, most of us. Uh, for us, hunger pangs is, I had breakfast 30 minutes ago and I think I want to eat some munchies. I got the munchies right now. I want to eat something now, the pre-lunch snack. This is America, and that's, that's the poor of America. That's, that's not the wealthy, that's the poorest. Um, I, I don't think there's any human being, uh, let me be careful here, there's no need for any human being to starve in the United States of America. They are locked in a dungeon somewhere and being maltreated if, if they are. But uh, we've been blessed. We don't know what famine is like, um, like other places in the world. Can famine... Uh, cause that? No. Famine cannot separate us from the love of Christ. Now this is important too as we study the Word of God. Remember the, the, the passage in Matthew uh, chapter 5 that God will supply our, the food like He feeds the birds and He'll provide clothing for us. 
Well, when there is persecution, okay, famine and hunger can come to the, to the body of Christ. Famine and hunger can come. We're talking under normal circumstances, God will provide these things. But when persecution comes, it is possible that we will suffer famine and actually die from hunger. Next we see nakedness. Uh, nakedness, nudity, can, can being stripped of our clothing. Now think about this, to be naked. It's very humiliating to be naked and paraded in front of people. Can that humiliation and shame, can that separate us from the love of Christ? No, it cannot. It cannot separate us from the love of Christ. It is impossible. It doesn't have the power. What about peril? Peril is danger, a life-threatening condition. You're in danger. No, that cannot separate us from the love of Christ. It can't do it. Tribulation can't. Distress can't. Persecution can't. Famine can't. Nakedness cannot. Peril cannot. Danger. Life-threatening condition. What about the sword? The sword here is used uh, in, a, in a lot of different ways in the Scripture. Number one, obviously a knife, a literal sword. It also is used descriptive of war. What if the United States gets into a war with China? What if the United States gets into a war with Russia? What if our economy collapses and war breaks out because we cannot any longer project our forces because we don't have any money? And now an invasion happens of Taiwan. I mean, pick any hundred scenarios. War results of that... And now hardship comes upon our family, and, and maybe we're drafted. I wonder, will they take me at 53? Will they say, hey, ring-a-ding-ding, -ding, I got Ron's number here, we're going to put you back in combat at 53? Maybe they would, I don't know. Does that mean that, that I would be separated from the love of God? What if I was killed in combat? What if, I, what if I was called back into service and I was put on the ground, and the very first day I was there, a bomb hits my, my uh, compound and kills me? And surely as defeated, right? No, 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 no. It cannot separate us from the love of Christ. Judicial punishment is also uh, used with this word sword. What if the government comes down and, and charges me uh, with, with a crime? Can judicial punishment separate me from the love of God? What if I'm cast into prison because of a conviction of a crime? Whether I committed or did not commit it, can, I, can that separate me? It cannot. Um, the fact is um, we are killed all the day long the scripture says for thy sake we are killed all the day long that's what the scripture says I believe it's Psalm 42 for thy sake he said these are real things guys because for thy sake it is written for thy sake we are killed all the day long we are counted as sheep for the slaughter have you realized that that you've been reckoned by the world as sheep for the slaughter Okay. It's, coming. it's coming. Nice segue. I'm glad you're here, Wes. Let's turn our little sheet over and let's talk about that. Turn your sheet over. Everyone turn it over. <laughs> Are we out of handouts over there? One to Dave. All right. Okay. So, as I was studying this and meditating on these things... I wanted to boil it down. I always try to make things as practical and realistic as possible so we can, we can say, okay, I see application here. And so the first thing that came to my mind was the Holocaust. And so I watched Schindler's List. That was part of my preparation. I uh, hadn't seen it probably since it came out. Maybe I've seen it twice and then I hadn't seen it in decades. So it was, it was very fresh and, and compelling. But I took detailed notes of these things because when we're reading this in Romans chapter 8, we're talking about intentional tribulation. We're not talking about, oh, the bills are not... I'm under stress because the bills aren't being paid. And that's a form of tribulation. It's a trial. It's pressure, certainly. But the text that we're reading is like, no, this is hardcore intensive. This is persecution with intent. Okay, this is, this is, this is no kidding... Uh, um, tribulation and persecution stimulated by Satan. So anyway, I'm going to go through this checklist as I meditated upon this film and took notes and I tried to make a flow chart that we could comprehend. And as we go through this flow chart, I want you to mentally think through all those terms we just looked at and apply them 
to these situations and see where we're at in America today on this checklist. But begins persecution, tribulation begins with Satan himself. So if you'll see in the first block at the top, and remember, this is under the umbrella, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? We're going to dive down into some despair and some discouragement right now for the next uh, few minutes. But we're going to come back up and be buoyed by the fact that none of these things can separate us from the love of Christ. It begins with satanic lust. The enemy of our souls, the accuser of the brethren, Satan himself, our adversary, has a passion. A, a passion of hatred. He said, remember, I am God. I am God. I will be like the Most High. He really hasn't changed that approach because remember his little, his little boy, uh, Antichrist, his boy, going to raise up and say, hey, he's going to profess himself to be God until he actually encounters God at the second coming, and then it's going to be exposed that he's a fraud. But Satan, nevertheless, I am God. He has a hatred of, of God himself, a passionate hatred from God. So if you have a hatred of God, guess where that comes from? It comes from Satan, who hates God. And by the way, we're born naturally, we're born His children, so we have an, a, an enmity toward God automatically the moment we come out of the, out of the birth canal into life. We have a, a hatred, a disposition against God. That's satanic. Satan has a hatred of God's people. He despises God. God's people. That's why we can say amen to this, that we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. And you've probably all heard that there have been more Christians martyred in the last century than all of Christian history since the beginning of the church. And that, those numbers are going to keep increasing. Okay, They're not going to decrease. So there's a hatred of God's people. Now here's a, here's a lie that he feeds us. Point number four says... God's people, to, he says this to his people, Satan speaking to, to the world, God's people are subhuman and they are the obstinate, obstinate hindrances to the greater good and progress of mankind. Okay, that's a satanic lie that's infused into the hearts of the world. That God's people are not really human. They're freaks. They're just not with it. They're, they're not intelligent like us. They're They're foolish. They're, they're profane. They're vile creatures. They're subhuman. You see, they must make us subhuman so that they can kill us without remorse in their own heart. Yeah. They're the obstinate. They refuse to give under. They refuse to understand their obstinate hindrances to the greater good and our personal progress. And number five, as I just thought these things through, Satan now stimulates the pleasure of unbridled sensuality. As the nation spirals down to a reprobate status, the exalted goal of life is to achieve whatever makes me feel good. And you know what? I feel like smashing your face in. Guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to persecute you. I'm going to pursue you. So this begins with a satanic lust, an unseen spiritual realm. Notice the arrow flows down now to Satan's children, the human puppets on the ground. Now remember, I, I pulled all these things from Schindler's List, but the application is here in the United States today. And I want you to make mental note, is this happening in the United States today? Oh, just watch MSNBC or something for 10 minutes. There you go. Just Between us and the Jews, I don't know who the bigger idiot is. Yep, and they will come for both. They despise both. Now, I'm using Hitler as an example, but Satan now will have a demonized leader. He always establishes a demonized leader. In World War II, it was Adolf Hitler. He was demonized. He wasn't just crazy. He was demonized. He had a hypnotic, supernatural, demonic power to influence the multitudes of people. And you know, there were obstinate people who did not. I love there's an image. It's an old image. Everyone's standing there, Sieg Heiling, and there's one guy standing there. Yeah. And it says, be this guy. Yeah. <laughs> right? Be this guy. That's what we want to be. We want to be this guy, the obstinate one. That stands against evil. But notice this. Hitler was a demonized leader. Okay. Now, listen to this. I'm gonna, I just, I, these were all just off the top of my head. I want to quote some things uh, recently. Satan's children, the human puppets, he begins with a demonized leader. Uh, the first quote is, listen to this. Maybe you've heard this. You know, you know, to just be grossly generalistic, 
you could put half of Trump's supporters into what I call the basket of deplorables. Right? Who said that? Hillary Clinton was this far away from becoming the President of the United States. She said, now, now listen to this, listen to her words, because they communicate what they want to do. You know, to just be grossly generalistic, you could put half of Trump supporters into what I call a basket of deplorables. Right? And everyone laughed and applauded. Okay? We could put you guys, you deplorables, in a basket. We could put you in a basket, you deplorables. Folks, they're preparing a place for the deplorables. They're preparing a place for the deplorables. Well, who, who might that be? It's us. We are the deplorables. You could put the deplorables in a basket. Oops. Did you record that? Oh, that didn't help my polling data. A demonized leader. Here's another quote. Extreme conservatives have no place in the state of New York. Who said that? Cuomo. Governor Cuomo did. Oh, was that like 50 years ago? No, it was like a week ago. Yeah, last week. Extreme conservatives. Oh, the liberals use the word dog whistle. So here's your dog whistle to liberals. Christians. Christians. Extreme conservatives, and how do you identify those in, the, in his talk? Pro-life. Pro-life. In fact, he used the word, he didn't say anti-abortion, he said right to lifers. How dare they be so extreme? They're monstrously extreme. They believe in life. They're pro-automatic weapons. How dare they resist our tyranny and our jackbooted aggression? And the third thing was they're anti-gay. These extreme conservatives have no place in New York. This is the governor of one of the most powerful states in the Union. This isn't some dog catcher in Podunk. <laughs> Number five, what's the fifth point? This nominee is really not someone who is what this country is about. Who said that? Anyone? Wes? It's a little bit older. About a year and a half older. That was the that was the candidate that actually did beat Hillary in the Democratic side. That oh. is Senator Bernie, Bernie Sanders. Bernie, yeah. Yeah. yeah, even Reagan against him, she couldn't He should have beat her. He did beat her, but she cheated and, and, and but nevertheless, this would have been the nominee. And he says, This nominee who was a Christian, he was reading his words back to him from a, a blog he had done, where he said that, oh my. Muslims don't know God and they're condemned. He was reading it back to him and he was furious with this man because he would not recant. And he said, this nominee is not really not someone who is what this country is about. What do you think happens when one of those people replaces Donald Trump? A demonized leader will be in the White House. Okay, Hitler was a demonized leader. Uh, then what happens after he gets a demonized leader? You say, oh, but America would never, never, never. We would never do that. We'd never let it happen. Oh, yes, we will. You think most Germans wanted to slaughter the Jews? You think they rose up and said, we want a leader who'll kill all the Jews? No. They wanted the trains to run on time. They wanted food. They wanted their Deutschmark to be worth something. And so they got a demonized leader, and he strategically put leaders here, 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 at chokeholds, at command positions. He didn't get everyone converted at once. He put people in key places. And then they executed his demonic will. And finally, underneath that, underneath the strategic leaders, what do you have? You have fearful and submissive soldiers and law enforcement agents. The average Joe who has a gun today, if he's ordered to go kill or go do this, or round up, then he's going to do it. Why? Because he's afraid. I don't want to be the one they round up. I'm going to go do it. You think they wanted to kill the Jews initially? No, but they knew if I don't do it, they're going to kill me like that. So I'm going to do it. Don't think Yankee Doodle and American flag and salute and America would never let this happen. We will let it happen. We do all the time. 
Folks, it is coming to this country. If you cannot see the storm rising, you are blind or your head is in the sand. We are going to face tremendous persecution very, very soon. If Jesus And Jesus Christ has not promised to rapture us out of here before America collapses. I haven't found that in the Bible yet. Okay. So, so that's how now Satan's children, human puppets, are in place. Okay? And boy, it makes you want to thank God for Donald Trump. Amen. Thank God for Donald Trump. Praise God. We would probably not be here worshiping today if... Miss Deplorable, we'd be in our basket now. Okay? Now, let's look now at the policy of Satan. Notice this, this is a progressive sword. Now again, we're thinking in context. Can tribulation... Ron, you're scaring me. This is not fun. I'm not getting a good warm goosies, Holy Spirit goosies. God, this is not what I came for. Remember, we're putting this into reality so we can say, can this separate us from the love of Christ? Progressive policy, it began with Mein Kampf. He wrote his book, Mein Kampf, Hitler did. He telegraphed everything he was going to do. That's what they're doing too. They're telegraphing it. They're telegraphing it. Okay? And what was the response in Schindler's list? Okay, this is how blind the Jews were. There's a scene where this, they're, they're already in the, in the uh, you know, the <laughs> stack them and rack them uh, uh, bunker, not bunker, but barracks. And they're talking, oh, I, I heard that they're, they're taking Jews in the trains and they're gassing them and they're killing them and burning them. Here was the response. It's ridiculous. I don't believe it. It's ridiculous. I don't believe it. As she is separated from her family on the top bunk of a barracks in a labor camp, it's ridiculous. I don't believe it. See, we'd rather bury our head and say, this is America, it's not Nazi Germany. Folks, we have rebelled against God. We are a reprobate nation. God's wrath should have fallen a long time ago. It's a miracle we're here today and His wrath hasn't fallen. But that was the response. It's ridiculous. They've been saying that forever. I don't believe it. Mein Kampf expressed the will of a demonized leader. What's the practice? So there's a policy and then there's a practice. The practice that came with Mein Kampf was that it was an introduction of specific satanic will to the mind of the general population. In other words, it, Hitler was the, was the prophet of Satan. As it comes down, he writes Mein Kampf and he begins to influence the minds of people. This is the first phase Mein Kampf was to begin to change the minds to introduce a specific satanic will, in this case it was the annihilation of the Jews, to the mind of the general population. And you begin to introduce it like when Satan came and said, Eve, let's talk. Let's chat. I just want to talk a little bit. Step number two in this progressive sword and persecution, targeted negative propaganda against the targeted population. Targeted negative propaganda. What is the practice? It is now to turn the minds of the general population against the targeted population. Negative repentance. Negative repentance. You used to like your Jewish neighbor. I want you to hate your Jewish neighbor. Okay? You used to think Christianity was great in America. Oh, what did Bernie Sanders say? This nominee is really not someone who is what this country is about. He did not want that man in power because of his Christian beliefs. Targeted negative propaganda. Point number three in the progressive sword and, and persecution. Now it comes targeted dehumanization. And that translated into public mockery and scorn and laughter. Targeted dehumanization. MSNBC, other programs that are mocking Christians. And now it's starting to spill out into the everyday lives that we experience. Uh, public mockery, scorn. Sorry guys, we're going to have bonus time now. Uh, i got to get through this sheet here. Um, <laughs> public mockery, scorn, laughter. Point number four. They had targeted new laws. They created new laws for the Jews. 
So they're going to have new laws. Why? Why do they have to have new laws? To justify oppression of the targeted population. How about Colorado? How about laws about, uh, you know, baking cakes and, and, and violation of those laws? How about San Francisco? California? New York? <laughs> on and on and on. Targeted laws against the targeted population. New Mexico pa is passing a bill that forces nurses and doctors to perform abortion, yeah. even Christians. Yeah. Who's that against? The extreme conservatives. Okay, they're gonna they're gonna lose their jobs. They're gonna lose their jobs. They're gonna lose their jobs. God's not gonna do a miracle and, and change the law, folks. They're gonna lose their jobs. It's point number five, establish impossible standards for the targeted population. At this point, the practice was routines. Their life routines and their lives were forcibly and radically altered. Okay? Point number six, targeted registration now. What's the purpose and the practice here? To separate the targeted population from the general population. Oh, you've got a church? I need to speak with the pastor, please. We have a new ordinance. You must sign up and be an approved church. In order to be approved, you must embrace homosexuality. You must not preach from the Bible. You must preach from this manual. And let me see your membership rolls. I want to see your membership rolls. Um, and they will find them. Folks, we can't hide from it. <laughs> okay, they've got all that they need through cell phones, through email, text, whatever. Uh, the underground church is going to be really difficult to establish in the United States. Uh, targeted registration. That's to separate us out from the targeted population, to separate us out from the general population. Point number seven in this spiral, document and detail the lives of the targeted population. So they, the Jews came up, and they're telling them all their skills and everything, they're writing it down, and then they sorted them out. You go there, you go there based on their lives. Well, I wonder where we're doing that. Oh, it's called Facebook. It's called social media. We've already registered. We don't even know it. We've already given them all the details. They don't need to line us up like Schindler's List. They've already got it. They've already got what they want. They will then mark the targeted population for easy public ID. What did the Jews have? They had a Star of David on their arm, right? They had to go around with that star or they'd be punished. And the purpose of this is to the targets of insults and random violence in public now. So in Schindler's Lifts, they walk by the star, they're laughing, they're spitting at them, they're throwing things and hitting them in the head as they walk by. Our modern day version of that is the, uh, the ridiculously powerful... Um, have you seen how good facial recognition tech is now? Uh, I'm somewhat familiar with it, yeah. yeah so, it, yeah. it doesn't matter. There's one picture of you out there if it's linked to something. Yes. You mm -hmm. know you yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And if you want to function, folks, this is what I'm saying. If you want to function in their world and not suffer, you're going to have to compromise. You're going to have to detach from Jesus Christ. Folks, that's why I'm telling you this. It's coming. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Thank God it hasn't come. How long did Noah preach? A long time before that he got in the ark, right? A long time. Well, God's about ready to close the door on the ark. Okay. Um, establish ghettos. This is where the deplorables come in again. Establish ghettos. We're going to isolate these people and keep them from the general population because, after all, these people are subhuman. They're obstinate hindrances to the greater good of humanity and personal progress. After all, I want to cut off my genitalia and call myself a woman, and they say that's wrong. That makes me very sad. I don't want to hear that. Put them in the ghetto. Put them in the FEMA camp. Put them in the barbed wire containment area, the Walmart store that has barbed wire around it. What's that all about? I don't know. Shouting an armed violent roundup. A shouting. Folks, when the economy collapses, all bets are off. See, that's the trigger. When the economy collapses, then they're going to do what they want because people will clamor for sausage over freedom. 
I don't care about my Second Amendment rights. I don't care about my First Amendment rights. I don't care about freedom of religion. Just feed me and make it like it used to be. I'll give up everything for that. Very well. And they'll come to our homes. They're going to come for us. They're doing it in China right now. In China right now, they have a social media, you have a social score. And if your social score is not at a certain level, guess what? You don't get to ride the train. Yo, we want to fly somewhere? What's your social score? Oh, you didn't support the party here? Guess what? You've been denied the access to the plane. Folks, you're going to have to make a choice. Do I stand for Jesus Christ or do I submit and deny Him? Uh, forcibly removed from homes, deprived of material possessions, formal loss of individuality, dignity, and personhood, division and betrayal among the targeted population. Even children had betrayed their parents. That's what the scriptures talked about. And remember the little kid, he had the hat on. He, 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 was, he was a Jew, but he was, he was serving the Nazis as they cleaned out the ghetto. And he blew the whistle, and he's like, oh, that's my neighbor. Oh, hey, you hide here. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to blow the whistle on you. Betrayal. Will there be betrayal in this church? Who's your pastor? Where does he live? Oh, yeah, it's Pastor Ron. He's right over here. Yeah. <laughs> You're not going to, I still get to eat? I still get to live here? Okay, yeah, Pastor Ron, here's his address, here's his phone number. You may call him? I'll have him over here. I'll tell him I have prayer need. He'll come on over. He drives the white motor. Reassignment of targeted population to labor camps. Division of families happens here. Point number 11, forced, vain, and oppressive labor on the targeted population. Here, break these rocks. Now move that stack over there. Now move it back over there. You didn't do it fast enough. And finally, the systematic murder of the targeted population. Now folks, thank God we're not there yet. We're not at point number 12. That's the unbridled systematic murder of those that Satan hates, which are God's people. That's not going to take much. It won't. Once the economy collapses, we'll fly down to point number 12. Because at that point, tyranny will rise up and take over this country. And you, you either go along to get along or you are filtered out. And only the extreme conservatives who have no place in the state of New York will be those who resist. They're already blaming conservatives for the collapsing economy. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So that's absolutely, they're going to blame Christians for the collapsed economy. Yeah, it's all, it's all the, the Christians and Jews' fault. Yeah, yep, it's all better. It's baked into the cake. Now, okay, I'm going to wrap this up. What are our individual responses to this? Unbelief. We can lie to preserve our lives. That happened in Schindler's List. We can betray one another to preserve our life. Prostitution to preserve our life. I'll do whatever you tell me to do. I'll do it. Just give me, keep, keep the sausage coming. Shaking, terror, and fear. People committed suicide. Uh, the prayerless terror. Uh, they were, we can mind the things of the flesh. Okay, that's, that's a carnal response. Okay, what's the response of faith? Well, we lose our life. So the flesh is preserve our life. The, the f faith will lose our lives in this time. What does that mean? We'll be faithful to Christ no matter what. We will not deny His name when we're challenged. We will not deny His name. Are you prepared for that? Are you prepared to be asked at gunpoint to say, do you believe in Jesus Christ? Are you one of these Christians? We've got to prepare for this mentally and prayerfully because in our flesh we won't, we'll say, no, 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 not me. And the pastor, pray for the pastor too that he doesn't do that. Uh, serve others. Think of Corey Tin Boom and the Tin Boom family. Serving other people in the midst of... We're going to shine as lights at this time. It'll be so dark. If you just serve other people and, and minister to them in this terrible time, it's going, to, it's going to speak volumes of the power of Christ in our lives. Faithful to holiness despite the cost. We'll have inner peace that passes comprehension. That doesn't mean there won't be fear and, and so forth, but there will be a, a calmness that God is sovereignly in control. We'll be constant in prayer. I just picture prayer meeting after prayer meeting. I go, oh, don't get up yet. We're not done praying. <laughs> you know. Oh, you got to eat. Okay, you go to the bathroom. All right. The mind of Christ in us. Now, both people die. The coward dies and the conqueror dies. And they stand before God. 
Can those things separate us from the love of Christ? No. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. We're more than conquerors in those times of persecution and trial. If we look at it from the carnality of our flesh, we'll say, no, 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 that's not conquering. If we look at it from the Word of God, we're more than conquerors in that. We're the sheep for the slaughter. And guess what? You can't kill us. You kill us, we raise again from the dead. You can't keep a good man down. I mean, good by Jesus Christ, the righteousness of Christ. We're going to close at this point. I did rush through that. But what I'd like for you to do is, is don't throw this away. Put it in a drawer somewhere you know. And when you see something like this on the news, say, where does that fall in this category here? Where are we at here? Where's this at? And what's the result? And what can I anticipate? Because I think this is a pretty accurate model. I mean, I might be off in a few places, but I think historically that it's, it's a pretty standard model of Satan's modus operandi. But remember, nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Nothing. None of that can. None of that can. All right. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful, God, for the assurances of your word. And Father, we need that assurance. As we recognize, Father, the storm that is, that is breaking upon us. Father, uh, with, with fear and trembling, God, help us to look to you. Help us, Lord, when we're sinking in the waves, Lord, to be like Peter and say, Lord, save me and reach out our hand, God, when we're terrified at what's on the news. We're terrified what we see in the streets. We're terrified what just happened to us at the store. God, let us reach out our hand and say, Lord, save me. And Lord, we know you'll reach down immediately and deliver us, God. You'll save us. You'll strengthen us. We thank you, God, that we're more than conquerors. Even if we suffer physical death, Lord, because of these things, we are more than conquerors through you, Lord, through Christ who loved us. So, Father, let us go in that assurance. God, we thank you now for the bread and the and the cup and the wine, Lord, the juice that is our hope, the broken body and shed blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, let us worship you now in the celebration of the Lord's Supper. We commit it to you for your glory in Jesus' name.